Well, greetings, folks. It's good to be with you once again, and this is our Wednesday Bible class. And uh, at least we do it on Wednesday, whenever it is that you will be visiting with us. Uh, we've been talking about we've been talking about something that is extremely important to our understanding of the salvation that we actually have now in Christ. And we've been talking about it as a term that Paul uses and is used in the New Testament many times, and that is the reality of our being in Christ. What a reality, what a reality that is. And it is said, it is said so very well, in, uh, and I want us to look at it in Second, Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians 5, Second Corinthians 5. Uh, verse 17. Now, we've been talking about this for some time. 2 Corinthians 5. We're going, to be, we're going to actually be reading from 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. Uh, but I want us to just start out with verse 17. Uh, well, let me start with verse 14. Verse 14. We're talking about a new creation in Christ. What a tremendous thing. What a tremendous thing that is. Because even as, as Christians, and most particularly as Christians, we think of We think of a new creation being something that is yet to come. And I can understand that if our thinking with regard to our union with Christ is based, is founded, is based upon what we see with our natural senses and hear with our natural ears, what we understand with our natural mind, then I can understand that overwhelming majority of believers believe that one day we will be a new creation, one day everything will be, uh, you know, will be different. Uh, everything will be at peace, uh, everything will be at joy, uh, everyone will love one another, and we go on and on and on because we're, we're trying to convert an old creation into, into something uh, that is spiritual. And not being able to do that through religion, even the Christian religion, then we have adapted uh, over a period of time, uh, and I say we, I mean in the Christian religion uh, and in the church world, we, we really use as our excuse what is called dispensational teaching. Uh, everything will be better by and by. Uh, <laughs> we have a lot of quartets have had over the years that have sang those kind of songs and everybody will clap their hands and get happy and they're looking for a time that is yet to come. The actuality 
is that the new creation in Christ is already come. It isn't something that you see with your natural eyes or hear or understand with your natural mind. But it is the reality of our salvation and those who come to see that reality in Christ by the Spirit of God will, on this earth, live according to that reality. Not looking for it in the flesh, but finding it in the reality of Christ and living accordingly every day a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now let me try to explain something. What I'm, let me try to just bring that into some kind of a focus. <clears throat> Most believers now are uh, many, many believers because there are, there are believers who, who understand what our life in Christ is all about. Uh, and it was, it was that that Paul spoke and preached, that salvation that he preached 2,000 years ago, right in the middle, right in the middle of, of natural Israel. Uh, and in the middle of uh, Gentiles who were worshipers of different gods. But out from out from natural Israel came believing Jews. I mean, Peter, James, John, uh, the disciples, and then those of those disciples and, and the others that were as apostles uh, in the church uh, that began on the day of Pentecost with the coming anew, the coming again of Christ in spirit and dwelling in those that were waiting on him fulfilling the day of Pentecost, and out of that came, came the church, came the church. And, uh, but as we begin to look, you know, over, over uh, the, with the formation of the Christian church and Christian religion, uh, we have looked at salvation as forgiveness of sins and that everything else would come later. Uh, a new creation would come later. Uh, life in Christ would come later. But we, we have preached, we have preached forgiveness of sins. Now that's, you find that, I mean, every TV preacher preaches that, every church you've ever been in preaches that in one way or another. Sometimes it's uh, because we come and say a sinner's prayer and we sign a, a card as a, to become a member of that church and, and so forth, or that we come and uh, we accept the Lord and we are baptized uh, in water one way or another. But after we do all of that, the, the thing that we, that we agree on that has taken place is that we are forgiven of sins. So what do we immediately do? We immediately want then and, and do uh, live differently. But here's the way we do that. And I'm talking about just in general Christianity now. Uh, it differs from denomination to denomination, but it's still uh, somewhat, it is, there's, this principle is still there. We begin to, quote unquote, live differently. Okay, if we, if, if we used to, let's, let's just say at one time, uh, we, we drank a lot of alcohol and we got drunk. Well, now that our sins are forgiven and we're Christians, we don't do that. We don't, we, many won't drink alcohol of any kind at all for any reason, and they don't get drunk. Now, I'm not telling you that that's not better than being a drunk or being an alcoholic. I'm telling you that there's more to salvation than that. Uh, and then we, we keep adding to it. Well, here's what we do and here's what we don't do. If you're a Christian, you, uh, you pray several times a day, you read your Bible, you go to church on Sunday, and if you have a Wednesday night prayer meeting, you go there too, all right? 
I'm trying to show you something. I'm trying to show you that, that, there, that you start even in the flesh and every day you live differently. You don't do what you used to do. You don't uh, go to places that you used to be found in. Uh, you live a better life. And there certainly isn't anything wrong with living a better life. But somehow in the doing of that, we begin to form a doctrine of our own concerning righteousness. Uh, and, and we begin to believe, and because it's preached this way, that righteousness is uh, what we it's more what we don't do than it is what we do. It's that no longer we dress the way we used to. We, uh, if we use tobacco, we don't use that anymore again. And, and uh, uh, we, we, we will watch some things. We won't watch other things on TV or in the movie house. None of that is in and of itself bad, but it's not it's not righteousness either. It isn't, we're not righteous by what we do or what we don't do. Now there is a righteousness of God, but that righteousness is Christ in you and the knowing of Him and, and, and the understanding of our union with Him. So if we're really going to follow righteousness the term righteousness, if we're actually going to follow that in the scriptures, and then we will find that righteousness is because of a relationship with Christ. It, it has, it, it's not brought about by what we do or don't do. Now that was under the law. And Paul kept talking about that, that he tried to be righteous under the law, and every time, every time he would look at the law, and because he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and this is all in Romans 7, but every time he would think that he was doing righteousness, he would find that he was missing righteousness, and that he wasn't righteous at all, and that there was nothing under the law that would make him righteous. And so in his epistles, he writes that, that if righteousness was by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Uh, but then he'll come and say, but Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. And the law was about what you did and didn't do when you did it and when you didn't do it, what you could eat, what you couldn't eat, what you could drink, what you couldn't drink. Uh, it was about being faithful to all of the feasts and all of the services of the tabernacles. Can you see, hon, we've transferred a lot of that right over into Christianity. Now, maybe what we do and don't do are, is different than it was under the law, but it's the same thing. We've We've kind of created our own law, as it were. And if you keep this law, then you're a Christian and you're righteous. And if you don't keep this law, uh, you know, if you don't go to this church, if you don't do this, if you don't dress this away, uh, if the ladies don't have their hair looking like this, if the men don't do, and it goes on and on and on. I mean, there's books written on it. There are books in every denomination called Tenets of Faith that you have to keep if you're going to be part of that denomination. And what I'm telling you is that it gets around to being called righteousness so that if you don't go to this church but rather go to another one, then, then you're not righteous. And there's all of the splits and all of the churches. And they're there, honey. I don't care... And not just in the Catholic Church, not just the Catholic Church being different from the Protestant churches, it's in all of the Protestant churches. We're trying to find a way, we're trying to find a way to live as those with 
un, as those with forgiven sins. We're no longer a sinner. Uh, we are, but then we're, we're, we're doing these things to be righteous so that one day when we die, we'll wake up in heaven and uh, heaven will be our home. What Paul began to preach, and let me just read this to you. I didn't plan on reading it, so I'll have to look it up. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, excuse me. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. Verse 30, because I don't want to read that whole chapter right now. Verse 29 says that no flesh should glory in his presence. That means there's nothing that you can do in the flesh that will glory, that is glorious in his presence. It's not about anything that you are in the flesh, whether you're man, woman, boy, girl, Jew, Gentile, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're, uh, it doesn't matter. That has nothing to do with it. Verse 30, now look at it. And I trust you will find it in your scriptures. Look at it. But of him, speaking of God, but of God are you in Christ Jesus. And that's what we're talking about in these sessions, the reality of being in Christ and what that means. What kind of a salvation Paul was presenting. But of God are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. And Paul goes on in his other epistles, and in this one too, to show you and I that there's nothing that relates to our salvation that Christ is not that very thing in us. For instance, love. Love is not an emotion that comes and goes any more than joy is, any more than peace is. Love, rest, peace, Joy is that which God hath made unto us, we who are in him. We who are in him. And again, we've been talking about the reality of being in Christ over and over and over again in these classes for, I don't know, for a long time. That being in Christ has to do with our union in Christ, and I'll look at that with you in just a moment. Maybe you haven't been in many of these sessions. But back to our verse again. But of him, of God, are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. He that glorieth, let him glory in what and who Christ is in you. Because Paul not only continually preaches as the believer's true salvation, as the believer's true spiritual position, he teaches that salvation is Christ in you, whereby you are in him. Now, this is what Jesus, this is what Jesus told his disciples in John 14. John 14. He starts out talking about in my father's house, and I'm going to, 
quote these verses closer to the original than it is in our King James Bible or even some of the versions that you might have. In my father's house, and the word there is household, in my father's household, in my father's family, in my father's household, they are many dwelling places. Actually, it, it's better, there are, they, they are many who dwell. There are many dwelling. It is, it is a many are dwelling in my father's house. My father's house is many dwellings, many dwelling places, but one house. And so he starts off that way and he says, I go, and he's going to the cross. This is through his death, burial, resurrection. This is through his coming again, all of which he says in John 14. I am going to prepare a place where? In my Father's house for you. I'm going to prepare, and actually that can be translated, I'm going to prepare myself as a place for you. I'm going to prepare myself as a place for you. Uh, I've got to look I've got to take you somewhere on that. I'm going to prepare myself. Now, that's in John 14. Remember that, John 14. I'm going to prepare myself a place for you. But I want to show you something that we have written in one of our, in one of our manuals, and I, and, and I can read it there better. Okay. Uh, do you remember Moses? You remember Moses at Sinai? Remember Moses at Sinai? These are important. I'm not off on something else. I'll bring this back together in a moment. Remember Moses at Sinai? He wanted to see the glory of God. But I just read to you a while ago salvation's answer for that and Paul's answer for that. I read it to you a while ago. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And it is true that he has brought many believers, many sons, into that glory, which is the presence of the Lord, which we'll be talking about in a moment. But do you remember Moses? Moses desired, I mean, all, you know, seeing God as he had seen God, the deliverance out of Egypt that he had seen, coming across the Red Sea and all of that. And now at Sinai, and what he desires is to see the glory of God. And beholding the glory of God. This is in Exodus 33. And it's a tremendous type, tremendous testimony of the appearing that Christ fulfills in one of the verses we've been dealing with over and over again, and I had and we'll continue to do that, if not in this session, another session, because we're gathering all of these verses up in one reality, and that's the reality of our being in Christ. So, what, what is being talked about there? This, the, the, there's a type and shadow set forth there in Sinai, and it's set forth for one reason, Moses desired to see the glory of God. It was his heart's desire to see the glory of God. That was his prayer. That was the prayer that he prayed. That was the one thing that he desired. And it was a type of the appearing of Christ that fulfills and is talked about in Hebrews 9.24. In Hebrews 9.24. So just, just remember that. Now, it is true that God demonstrated in this story that Moses could not look upon his face and live. But he also demonstrated in this story that he would not look upon Moses without him being fully covered 
fully hidden, fully clothed in Christ. And that's what I read a while ago. But of God are you in Christ, who hath clothed you with himself. Now, I didn't read those words a while ago, did I? But I was saying the same thing. Of God are we in Christ Jesus, who is made unto us wisdom. Therefore, we're clothed in his wisdom. Righteousness. Therefore, we're clothed in his righteousness. But what does that mean? It means Christ, to be clothed upon with Christ. And I want to talk to you about that in sessions coming up when we talk about the true building of God, the true house of God, the true tabernacle of God. And I want to talk to you in, 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 in these sessions about, about that. Uh, for instance, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, which I'll get back to reading in a minute, uh, verse 1, 2 Corinthians 5. Now stay with me on this Moses story. I'll put all this together in just a minute. 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know, now this is something that Paul understands, for we know, we know, and I'd have to read that whole fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. You read it. For we have this treasure in earthen vessels. For God hath shined in our heart to give the light inside of us so that we can see something and know something to give the light of the knowledge of the glory that Moses wanted, that Moses wanted to see. But Paul is saying, here we are in Christ, and Christ is dwelling in us, and God hath shined, hath shown us this. God hath opened the eyes of our understanding that we may know. So God hath shined, and this is 2 Corinthians 4 and 6. And that comes all the way down to chapter verse 17 of the 5th chapter. That's where we're going with all of this. For God hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God where? in the face of Jesus Christ, who Paul is not preaching as being way off somewhere there. No, he is presenting Christ in you. Even there, in, 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 uh, right under verse 6 of chapter 4, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Then he goes on to explain it's not about the earthen vessels, it is about the excellency of the power of God, and Christ is the excellency of that power, and he does dwell in us. And he keeps talking about that right on through the fourth chapter, into the fifth chapter, and finally, here in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, For we know, we know, because of what he has said, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, now whether there he's talking about the natural physical body or maybe he's talking about that also, but he is also giving reference to the house which is in Jerusalem, the temple, the old temple of the old covenant in Old Jerusalem, that was there at that time, and the Jews still claiming that's the house of God. Although Jesus has, has already said, by the time Paul is writing this, Jesus said it's recorded in Matthew 24, it's recorded in Luke, it's even recorded in John. Jesus has said this, this place is going to be destroyed, I will raise it up in three days. The Jews did not understand that, but they knew that he was talking to them about that temple. And they said, 
How can he do that? How can he say that he can raise this temple up in three days? Well, he was talking about another temple that is spiritual, even his body. This is all written in, in John, I think it's in John 2, Gospel of John, chapter 2, chapter 3. But he's talking about, Paul came to see the body that we are in him. See, that's another reality of our being in Christ. Because we are in Christ, we are his very own body. Hun, the tabernacle of Moses was a type and shadow of the body that you are now in Christ. The temple of Solomon simply enlarged upon that testimony. But it was still a testimony of the body that you are now in Christ Jesus. It's not something you're going to be, it's who we are. But it is not understood by the natural mind, nor can it be, but rather it is understood in the, by the Spirit of God in revealing the true occupant of His true house, of his true body, and that occupant is Christ in you. And this is the way Paul preached him. He preached salvation as Christ in you. But what did Jesus say about it in John 14, verse 20? He said, in that day, and he's not talking about some day yet to come, not back there with his disciples. He was talking about what would happen on the day of Pentecost, and that's the very reason that just before he was ascended, he, he ordered them, he ordered them to go to one place, and that was the, the temple, and to remain there for the next ten days. To remain there, waiting on the power that would come. Waiting on what he had promised them, that he would come and dwell in them, in chapter 14 of John. And in that day, the day that came, the reality that came with Pentecost, the reality that came with Pentecost, the fulfillment of Pentecost, at that day you will know that I am in my Father. You've seen me go. Now you will know that I have come anew. You will know that I went to my Father. You will understand that because I told you that I had to go to my Father in order that I might come and dwell in you. You will know that I'm in my Father. This is all in John 14, 15, 16, and 17. Verse 20, you will know in that day that I'm in my Father. I came out from my Father. I went to the cross. I went back to my Father. And I came and received you unto myself so that where I am, there you may be also, again, John 14, about the Father's house. And I told you that a while ago, the Father's household. I'll receive you unto myself, John 14, 3. That where I am, you may be also. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Now, hon, that wasn't a someday situation with them. It's not a someday situation now. It was all summed up in 50 days. 50 days after it was said. And in that day you will know I am in my Father. But look at the second thing. And you are in me. Now, hon, if you look at this, you can't deny, if you know the epistles of Paul, you can't deny that that is exactly the reality that Paul is preaching. No wonder he said, it pleased God to reveal his Son in me that I might preach him. 
And that's what he does. He preaches Christ as our very salvation. He preaches the union that Christ has received us into in himself. That our union with the Father is directly by and in the Son. So he says there, you'll know I'm in my Father, that you are in me, and then, what's the third thing? And I in you. Now that's why we're sitting here in these sessions using that as the very basis of what we're talking about. We're talking about Christ, all right, but we're talking about Christ in you. We're talking about the body of Christ, the building of God. We're talking about, actually, in reality, the city of God. We're talking about that. We're talking about you in Christ. Not only are we accepted of God in the beloved, certainly we are. But it is there that we dwell. We dwell there. Accepted of God is not just a one-time thing. It's a, it is an eternal thing. It is an eternal thing. Accepted in the beloved. Dwelling in Christ. And Christ being our resurrection. If everything that he is, he is in you. The resurrection and the life. The righteousness of God. The wisdom of God that is made manifest at the cross is Christ himself. The wisdom of God. Sanctification. How are we set aside unto God? Through the Son who liveth in us. We having no life but Him. And yet, hon, that is the only life That there is. In reality. There is no other life. Either Christ liveth in you. John, read the gospel of John. Either Christ liveth in you. Or you have no life. What I'm trying to say. Sweetheart. Salvation is much more than sins being forgiven. Salvation is much more than you not being an alcoholic. Salvation is much more than you and I not being a sinner. Salvation is much, much more. Salvation is Christ living in you, bringing you, your very soul, into union with himself. So much so, that he says, I am in my Father, you are in me. Our union, and, and how? I am in you. Verse 3 of John 14, he's answering that. I am in you. I have received you unto myself, and I am in you, so that where I am, there you are also, because I am in you. You are my very body. You understand what I'm telling you? It is a tremendous, our salvation is a tremendous thing. The reality of our being in Christ is what I'm talking about. But we're talking about Moses. He desired he desired to see the glory of God. He desired the presence of God. 
And it's true that God demonstrated in this story that he that Moses couldn't look upon his face and live. But there's another thing we talk about often, and that is God also demonstrated that he could not look upon Moses without him being fully covered and clothed in Christ. And in Exodus 33, 21, And the Lord said, Here is a place by me. We might as well write Christ there because Christ fulfilled that place. It was on a rock, but who is the rock? And in a minute we'll read, he put him in the cleft of the rock. We're in Christ. Colossians 3, 1 through 4, tremendous, tremendous thing. For there we read, if you then be risen with Christ, Set your whole mind, your whole thought, set your affection upon things above. That doesn't mean way off somewhere in heaven. The above there is if ye be risen with Christ and are seated in Christ in heavenly places. Because in chapter 15 and all, or in in, in Ephesians 15 and also in Colossians, the first three chapters, Paul says, you're quickened together, raised together, seated together. This is by the very life-giving Spirit, Christ Himself, dwelling in you, hon. You have life living in you. Therefore, you are clothed upon with life. Your soul is not naked. It's not naked. It's not naked. If, 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 what, what did Adam see in the garden after he sinned, he and Abe? They saw that they were naked. How? They saw they were in the flesh. And they became naked to one another. They were naked. They were not clothed upon. Well, sweetheart, and throughout the history, when when the priests ministered, they had to be clothed in undergarments as well as overgarments, so their nakedness would not appear. Because it's always been a type of the flesh. It's always been a type of our own flesh. Being in Christ has to do with our being clothed in Christ. That when the Father... What happened when the father, even in the old covenant, when the father looked at the high priest, who did he see? He saw Christ. He had to dress that way. He had to dress in such a way that typically, in type and shadow, he was Christ. Everything he wore was symbolic of Christ. His outer garments, his undergarments, everything he wore was symbolic of being clothed upon with Christ. But with the high priest, it was symbolic of Christ. That's how he went beyond the veil. That's how he went into the presence of God. If he hadn't been so clothed, he would have died. And that's what God tells Moses here. You you can't see me and live. So he talks to him about there is a place here. There is a place by me. Remember John I was talking to you about a while ago? John 14, Jesus saying, I will prepare a place for you. And I said it could be translated, I will prepare myself a place for you. Because he goes on to say, I'll come and receive you unto myself. Yes, hon, the place in type here is a rock. But that's a type of Christ. And you shall stand on the rock, which is Christ. And so shall it be that while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, hidden in Christ, and will cover you with my hand covered with Christ in the presence of God, while I 
pass by. This is the same thing Jesus says. It's the same thing. This is Jesus presents himself as the fulfillment of this in John 14. And, and, he, and, and in 15, 16, and in 17, that they may all be one. Father, that they may be with me where I am and behold my glory. Again, his prayer there was as he was going to the cross. And he wasn't praying for some day in the never-never land. He was talking about the reality of the salvation that was coming on the day of Pentecost. And that's the salvation, hon, that Paul continually talks about. And so, when he's writing these letters, he talks about that salvation. But we try to understand it with a natural mind. And so, when we read here, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We read the same thing over here in Hebrews. Since we do, I'm going to read it to you in Hebrews uh, 9, 24. Now we'll be reading all of these things time and time again. And we'll gather some up as much as we can in each service. Hebrews 9, verse 24. I'm in Hebrews 12. Hebrews 9, verse 24. Here we are. Now listen to this. Let me read verse 1, 2 Corinthians 5 again. Let me read it again. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We've got to look at several verses. Here's one of them. A house what? What was it? Let me read it here in verse 24, Hebrews 9. For Christ is not entered, is not entered, into the holy places, speaking of the old tabernacle and the old temple under the old covenant, made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. But you see the word for there doesn't mean as though we are in one place and he is, you know, we're in one place and, and he is in a, another place. That's not the picture that is there. That's not the picture that's there at all. Uh, let me read something else to you here. Uh, if I can, uh, let me see. Let me see. Uh, let me see here. I'm fine. What I wanted to read to you, right quick. Uh, I'm not finding it. Well, then I won't read that. So again, back in Hebrews. Uh, let 
Let me read this to you, Hebrews 8. And notice what we have read here now, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And we have also, in verse 1 of chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, said we have a building of God. It's something that Paul is saying we already have. We're already, we already are in Christ, clothed upon with Christ. We are already the body of Christ, and Christ dwells in us. Now that's what Paul is saying here, and he brings it, he brings it finally to verse 17, which I said I wanted to read to you, so in the next five minutes here I'll read this to you. Therefore, because just what, I've, what, what little I've said right now, therefore, because it's what he's saying in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. Can you start reading there when you have time and read through verse 17 and remember how Paul uses the therefores, wherefores, look at that. We know that if, that if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, if that is meaning when Jerusalem and the temple were torn down in 70 A.D., and the whole thing was destroyed. Israel, under the law, was scattered out throughout. Uh, the destruction came, uh, as Jesus said it would. Uh, and so that, that old Israel and that Jesus said, you see this, it, there won't be a stone left upon it. He said, destroy this temple three days, I will raise it up. They said, how can it do that? But he spoke of the temple of his body. And that's the body that you and I are joined to, hon. That's the body that we now are. So we know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Now, I read that to you in Hebrews 9, uh, verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Look with me at Ephesians, the second chapter. And he's talking to the, to the Gentiles. He's talking primarily to the Gentiles. But he's talking to everyone, Jews and Gentiles. He's talking to those that are now in Christ how that you used to be enemies of God, you were without God, and all of that in the first few verses of Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. And then he says, But God, for his great love wherewith he hath loved us. Now you want to see the love of God? You want to see the love of God? Somebody said, Well, the love of God, he forgive me of my sins. All right, you can put that in there. He forgive us of our sins. But that's not the sum total of the love of God. Look at it there in Ephesians. For God, for his great love, great love, wherewith he hath loved us. What did he do? He hath quickened. That means life, brought to life. Quickened with the spirit of life. Quickened us. Christ, it means Christ in you. Quickened. Having life. Quickened us together. The word together there means as one. What is it talking about? His body. His body. Look at the last three verses in chapter 1, because that leads you right into chapter 2, and it's talking about giving him to be the head of, his, of, of the church, which is what? The church which is his body. The church which is his body. Not the church which is on the corner, that's a building. The church which is his body, the fullness of him who filleth all and in all. Now, how is that so? By his great love, he hath quickened us as one body, as one building. As one tabernacle, he hath quickened us as one body. He has raised us together as one, as one body. 
And there's another term there, with Christ. Has quickened us together with Christ. Has raised us together with Christ. And seated one body. Quickened, I am the resurrection and the life. Quickened together, raised together, and seated together. Where? In Christ. Now that is exactly what we're reading in verse 24 of Hebrews 9. Of Hebrews 9. For Christ is not entered into holy places made with hands and honey, neither are we. Neither are we. Which were the figures of the true, but into the heavens hath raised us up, seated us together in the heavens, in Christ. And that's where he presents us to his Father. Not as many, not as many, but as one body in Christ. Quickened, raised, established, clothed upon, made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, everything that he is, he is in you and I. The Father looks and sees his Son and receives all of those who are in that Son as being the body of that Son. Many who are one, the many who have come to be one in Christ, many sons brought unto glory, many sons brought into the very presence that Moses desired, brought into the very glory that Moses desired to see, brought into the salvation that God promised even on Sinai, using figuratively the rock. For that was a prophecy of the one who was to come, Christ himself. Christ himself. You see that in the temple of Solomon, because the rock was laid there, when it came together as the foundation, there was there, not a noise could be heard. It was as one foundation, one rock. And that's Christ, hon. But we're not built upon him like a natural foundation building is that it actually, you know, no. He is the foundation, the one foundation. We are the one building, the one body of Christ, but we're built up into that foundation. So you can't, you, you cannot, it's the reason people have trouble doing it, you can't really picture this new creation in Christ. Verse 17, if any man be in Christ. And we've been talking about that, in Christ, in Christ. Raised up together, in Christ. There's the new creation. What is not found there? Old things. 
And that's not old things about me. That's me, period, as an old thing. The Adamic creation, be it Jew or Gentile, be it rich, poor, be it bond free, is not found there. No, we're found there as a new creation in Christ. We're found there as those having no life except it be Christ himself. So we're found there as one, as the body of one new man, not an old man made better. That's the reason in this same reading that I've read to you in chapter 5, the emphasis is made that henceforth, henceforth we know no man after the flesh, nor do we know Christ after the flesh. If we have known him after the flesh before, know we him now no more after the flesh. Why? Because if any man be in Christ, we cannot know him after the flesh. We have to know him after the spirit. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, the true translation of that reads, Behold, the new is come. Who is come in the new creation? Christ is come in the new creation. Christ is come. He's not formed by hands. He's not formed out of the dirt. Christ, by his eternal spirit, is come. And his body is not made by hands either. But it is a work of the Holy Spirit himself. Well, all right. Out of time, and I'm finished. But we're not through. We're not through. Hun, there's so much to be gathered up in this that I, every time I sit down, there's no one way to do it. Because I'll read one verse and I see that this verse connects half a dozen other verses and then there we go. But we'll always come back because we're talking about the reality of being in Christ and we're looking at the greatness of that, a new creation. The newness of which is Christ himself. The newness of which is Christ himself. The new man, Christ himself. New creation. And I want us to see just how new, how absolutely other than the old creation, the new creation of God in Christ really is. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created of God in Christ. You ever thought about that? That's our salvation, darling. And may the Lord open our eyes to see truly our salvation in Christ. My, my. It's not a ticket to heaven. It's the reality of heaven. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for allowing us to come in to your, wherever you are, office, home, and share with you. If we can help you, let us know. The Lord bless. Amen.